we're talking today, I absolutely want to make sure you have those reflexes. Shareholders agreements. Ridiculously boring. And it's obviously, it's hyperbole. When I say ever exciting, it's not ever exciting. It's complete bore. Um, but it's, it's so important, and I'll tell you why. I do litigation on very specific circumstances, mostly in a commercial setting. Now, I all, will advise all my startups to have a shareholder agreement. Last week, I got a call, and it is a corp, it's a company that has a restaurant. Two guys, they got into business two years ago. They got in, each of them injected 100 grand. Things were hard, they hustled, they worked 100 hours a week plus. And um, they finally got the business up to a point where it's hot up, it's profitable. They're making money, things are happening, they're getting interest, they're getting interest from franchisor, franchisees who want to take their model and go elsewhere. There's a problem. One of the owners has since decided he wants to rediscover his homeland in Egypt. He wants to go back home, he wants to travel, he has business interests in, in Egypt. So he's not around. He's gone for months at a time. So the shareholder calls me and he goes, what the hell? He told me he was going to be there half the time. He's never around. He doesn't want to come. He doesn't return my calls. And when he comes, he's starting fights with my, with my employees. The first question I ask him, where's the shareholder agreement? Oh, you know, we never got around to signing it. And we have a draft that my lawyer sent me back then. But you know, things got busy. So I'm like, okay, okay, this is gonna be fun. So I look through all the other documents, and there's nothing. There is no saving grace for these guys. So what do I do as an attorney? I have to write the, the defaulting uh, shareholder nasty letters. And I have to tell them things like, you're not respecting your obligation. And you're gonna bring this company down to, uh, to, 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 you know, to, 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 the, to the abyss if you don't get your shit together and come back from Egypt and respect your obligations. Oh, and by the way, stop coming and bothering all the employees. We don't want to see you. So that's the lawyer, that's the letter I sent him. But the biggest problem is that there will be no easy exit strategy or there is no way for these two people to separate easily. They're stuck together. They are married. And they will live happily ever after whether they like it or not. Whether I get in the picture or not. The only one who will win is the lawyer who will probably make a lot of money from each of them fighting for a very long time. So if there was a shareholder agreement, there could have been something like a shotgun clause in which one of the guys could have attributed a value on his shares and forced his partner to buy him out, for example. Even worse, what happens if one of these two bozos dies? What happens? Well, the estate, if there's any value there, they've basically just given their estate a reason to fight. So one estate, the estate is going to say, no, the shares are worth a million. And the guy who's alive is going to say, are you crazy? They're probably worth 50 grand. And then, so, so I still have a client in the estate. They're going to continue the fight. So if there's a shareholder agreement and the guy dies, I look at clause 9 and I say, OK, if the guy dies, here's, we, here's how we set the value. And here's how, the, here's how the parties break up. If there's a shareholder agreement with a nice shotgun clause, I know that there's a mechanism to set the value. So the lawyer has to apply the shareholder agreement, not write him stupid letters about him not coming to the restaurant. I, I, I have material. So this is why the ever exciting shareholder agreement that will cost you measly money today is essential going forward because people break up, people have different agendas, people die, and people go to Egypt to rediscover their homeland. So that's, that's, this, this is the take home message. So Duny, if you go to the next slide. Is anyone from Egypt here? Okay, good. It's beautiful there, by the way. <laughs> so these are gray zones. All of these agreements are, in, um, uh, are to avoid these legal gray zones. I don't like legal gray zones. I like them for my bottom line, because my attorneys make a lot of money on them, but they're not good for you. They are not good for you. Legal gray zones answer, are, are, are where you find yourself if there's no shareholder agreement, company goes bankrupt. Somebody wants to leave the company. If somebody commits fraud, 
if the, somebody passes away. So yes, we have a civil code. It comes from Napoleon in France. We've readapted it over the centuries. But the law does not address these very specific questions. We don't know what happens when someone fraud. When somebody commits fraud, yes, there's a criminal code. But it doesn't give you a blueprint about what the effect is on the shares they own and the value of the company. Nobody knows. It's up for guys like me to make an argument about what happens. If there's no shareholder agreement, we go into the abyss and we fall in the legal gray zone. You don't want to be in the legal gray zone. So the shareholder agreement will prevent you from getting there. <laughs>